You're listening to the Finding Christ in the Old Testament series, preaching by Pastor Rick Dressler at Maple City Baptist Church in Chatham, Ontario. For more information about Maple City, please visit us online at maplecitybaptistchurch.com. Years ago, when I was a youth pastor, we had an activity, and the activity was in an old barn. It was a huge, big, beautiful barn with beautiful beams and and just a, a great site for youth activity. And when I was there working on this particular activity, I had my boys with me, my oldest, AJ, and then my middle one, Gregory. At the time, AJ was probably seven and Greg was four. I had finished the work there. The boys were helping when they could. They were playing at other times. And there was a loft in this barn, and I I don't want to exaggerate, but I think the loft was about 15 feet, maybe, give or take a few hundred feet. So about 15 15 feet, maybe 20 feet. And so I was getting ready to go, and I said to my oldest at the time, AJ, seven, I said, AJ, come on, we're leaving. Jump into my arms. And without even hesitating, the kid backed up, and he ran, and he took off, Superman style. And sure enough, he's coming, and I catch him, and I grab him. He's thinking, this is great. This is wonderful. At the time, David was not born, But if I were to ask David to do the same thing, I'm sure he would jump like that, but try to give me a karate kick to the face, all right? A little different, different. All your children are different. But here was Gregory now at four years old, and he just saw his brother jump in my arms, and and he looked, and I said, okay, Greg, come on, jump in my arms. And Greg got to the, the edge of the loft, and he looked at me. He looked at the ground. He looked at the ceiling. He looked at the space between us. He looked at his brother. He then could, you could tell he was sizing me up to see whether I was capable or not of catching him, which, by the way, he, he weighed back then about what he weighs now. Um, <laughs> just stretch that. And, and you could tell in his mind the wheels were turning. Dad, I'm not sure that you're capable of catching me. And, Dad, I'm not sure that you love me enough to catch me. And I'm telling you, I I begged, I pleaded, I told him his brother just did it, I told him I'd give him money. I did. Money, cookies, donuts, whatever. Just jump, Greg. And Greg would not jump. I'd go up and get him and bring him down. And what Greg failed to realize at the time was that I was more than capable of catching him. I understood that if I missed him, I would be killed. (laughs) <laughs> but I, I would have done anything to make sure I caught that kid. I was capable of doing it, and I did truly and do truly love that child. I, I would have given my right arm had I known anything could have gone wrong. And again, I, I wouldn't want to face my wife and tell her the great idea I had to let the kids jump off a six-foot loft, or 15, or 20. And in his mind, he could just not fathom that I was capable or I had the character to catch him. I wonder sometimes as we go through life and and life happens. I appreciate the prayer this morning from Brother John about as we look and see our world swirling around us. We see evil, we see wickedness, we see tragedy. And we don't just see it on a screen a thousand miles away. We see it in our own backyards, in our own lives. And I have to wonder sometimes if if you, like me, as we look around, as we view what's happening in our own lives, as we see the sinfulness of others and how it wreaks havoc in the lives of others and sometimes in our own lives, if we, if we question God and say, God, are, are you capable of handling this situation? And Lord, can I trust your character that as you handle this, you handle it in a way that shows that you have my best interest in mind, that you truly love me. We are in a portion of scripture, we've been there for some time now, um, about Absalom. And and I want to be careful this morning. Sometimes we miss the forest for the trees, and we look at small details, and we look at stories and characters, 
and, and we don't really see the big picture. And so this morning, as we start, I'm going to give you the big picture, okay? So that when we're done this morning and you wake up after the service, you know what they say about people sleeping in the service? If you were to take all the people who fall asleep in a mo- Monday morning service and you were to lay them from head to toe, they would rest more comfortably. Okay? But when we're done here, here's what I want you to know. I want you to know that you can trust our God. I want you to know this morning that he is capable. And I want you to see this morning his character. And wherever you find yourself today, whether you know, figuratively, you're right on the precipice of taking that jump, or, or you find yourself in deep waters. I want you to see from our text and where we're at as we sort of back away from that, the bigness of our God, and that you can trust him. In 2 Samuel, chapters 13 through 18, we have the story of Absalom. And, and we have been here for some time. We'll continue until about chapter 18. But if you've been with me with this story, you know that Absalom is a scoundrel. He's a wicked, wicked man. He is narcissistic. Um, It's all about himself. He couldn't care less about anyone but himself. He has, in a very cold and calculating way, killed his oldest brother. Um, He comes back to the kingdom now. He's been away for uh, three years. He comes back to the kingdom, and now he's calculating to put himself in a position to first kill his father and then take the the throne from him. And this is Absalom. And in Absalom's life and in his wickedness and in his decisions, there will be a wake of broken, destroyed lives because of his sin. And maybe we look around in that and and we, we wonder, God... Are you aware? Do you know? Are you capable? Do you care in this story? And so this morning, we are going a little bit backwards so we can sort of just just phase out a little bit to see what I hope will be the big picture of the God we serve and the God we are to trust with all of our heart. Backwards now, chapter 12 of 2 Samuel. Look with me, if you would, at verse number 10. This is, this is now Samuel giving the, the judgment against David for David's sin. And, and Samuel the prophet is speaking. This is what the Lord is saying to you, David. Verse number 10. Now therefore, the sword shall never depart from thine house, because thou hast despised me and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Thus saith the Lord, behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house, and I will take thy wives before thine eyes and give them unto thy neighbor, and he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of this son. For thou did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. You see, that's really a weird verse to read. I don't even know why you read that verse. It doesn't make sense to me. Listen to what's happening here. We have been in the life of Absalom. Absalom um, is wicked. His decisions and his actions are hurting lots of people and will continue to hurt lots of people. And as you look at the story, it seems as if Absalom is just running wild. And yet I want you to see, five years prior to Absalom doing anything, here's what the Lord said. David, because of your sin, here's what's going to happen. The sword will not leave your house. This is what the Lord said. And now we find that everything that God told David that would happen is happening just like he said. Absalom is that person in his house that is one of the swords that is wreaking havoc now in David's life. And God was aware, God said it, and Absalom, in his own wickedness, without being coerced by God, without God moving him this way, in his own wickedness, unbeknownst to him, he is completely fulfilling God's word. Now stay with me. God said this would happen. It does happen. Absalom does it on his own, with his own desires, his own will. He acts this way. And yet, 
Absalom will be held responsible for all of his actions. Now, this morning, I want you to see clearly the sovereignty of our God and human responsibility. It's important this morning that we get this. When I say the sovereignty of God, what I mean is this, that our God rules all reality. He is the sovereign God. He rules everything. And when I say man's responsibility this morning, I say this, that men and women make decisions, make choices, they do things, and they are accountable for their actions. God is so big and so great that as we make choices, as we decide to do things, all of those things will eventually never foil his plan, never foil his objective. It will always come to fruition just as he said. And yet, man is still responsible. So you say, well, how does that work? I'm glad you asked. Because I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how it is that people can commit evil crimes on their own, and yet God is so big that he will still work through those things and will still bring his ultimate plan to fruition. You say that's inconceivable. It doesn't make sense to me. And let me caution some of you this morning. We have this idea that we can just neatly put our God into a box. And so we put him in a box, and we've got all of this figured out. And so we say, wait a minute, that that can't be the case, or this can't be the case. And we come to this area with real pride in our lives. Let me caution you. When you think you have God figured out, you are in real trouble. He doesn't fit nice and neat into your little box or anyone's box. And some of you sit and you think, well, I've got all the answers on this. Can I tell you something? You don't have all the answers on God. And if you did, he wouldn't be God. This wouldn't be. And if you're not careful for some of us, as we come before this idea of God's sovereignty and man's responsibility, we, we act as if, well, if I just had an audience with God, I would sort of straighten him out on this thing. It reminds me of another fellow who wanted an audience with God. His name was Job. Do you remember? And, and terrible things happened in Job's life. Terrible things. Lost his wife, lost his children, lost everything. And as he views his own life, he says, wait a minute, God, what is going on? And he's so distraught that he says, if only I had an audience with God, I would, I would set him straight. And so in Job chapter 38, um, God gives Job an audience. And the first thing that God says to Job is this, who are you? Who are you? That, that comes a darkened counsel. Um, It's an interesting phrase, because God looks at Job and says, who do you think you are? We have a guy um, that we know for the last couple years now has been trying to be our friend on Facebook. I know it's a very popular place to be, our friend on Facebook. And so he has a a Facebook, we have Facebook requests, and he requests almost every couple weeks, he is requesting to be friends on our Facebook. And the truth is, I'm not looking for new friends, I'm trying to dump a couple already that I have. And, and so we just ignore it. We've been ignoring it for years, and every couple of weeks it comes up. And he, he's even changed his name. He's changed a bunch of things, trying to sneak in there. And so um, last week, Kim and Greg were in a store, and they saw the guy. And so they're going to talk to him and say, hey, listen, how are you doing, and try to explain stuff. And so Kim walked up to him and said, hey, so-and-so. And he looked at them and said, who are you? Do I know you? Like, yeah, you're the idiot that keeps on trying to be friends with me on Facebook. But how, how humiliating it is for someone to say, do I know you? Who are you? And God looks at Job and says, Job, who are you? Who, do you? who do you think you are to put me in your box? And then he says, gird up your loins. Put your big boy pants on. We're going to talk for a little bit. And then, and then God, for the next few chapters, says, Job, where were you when I laid the foundation of the world? If you know, please tell me. Where were you when this happened? And where were you when that happened? Can you give me an answer? And he goes on and on until finally at the end of the chapter, uh, several chapters, 42, Job says, Lord, I repent. I was so foolish to even think I could put you in some kind of box. Listen to me. We are slightly underqualified to be God. Or to put him in our box. Listen to what, what, uh, what 
uh, Chrysostom, an early church father, said, speaking about how God operates and who he is. He said, who are you? Ponder first your nature. In no way can anyone find a name to express your nothingness. Obviously, he didn't go to self-esteem classes. And what he was saying is this, you better think about your own nature first before you start trying to put God in a box that you fully grasp. It can't be done. My friend, if we think that we can comprehend all of these mysteries of the Bible, you're insane. We, we can't even figure out how we lose socks in a dryer, let alone how our mind works or the universe works or any of it. Consider your nature. If you live 150 years, your life is like a, a breath, a vapor, the span of a hand, a tale that is told. It's over. It's over. This is a mystery. But it's a mystery that the writers of the New Testament and all the Bible don't flinch at. Let me show you something very interesting about God's control and man's responsibility. Uh, Acts chapter 2 this morning. Look with me, if you would, at verse number 22. Acts 2, verse number 22. This is Peter speaking on Pentecost. And here's what he says. You men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God Ye have taken, and by wicked hands you have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, having loosened the pains of death, because it is not possible that he should be holden of them. And here you have Peter saying, listen, I want you to know something. We sang about it. We read about it earlier. Before the foundation of the world, God had a plan. God had a program that man's redemption would come through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. It was preordained. It was going to happen. God said it. It did come to pass. Whatever he says comes to pass. But then he says, you guys are responsible by taking your hands and killing the Lord of glory. And so we see again God's sovereignty. Man's responsibility, there's a tension. Now listen, this morning, here's what I do not want to do. I don't want to sit here as you're looking at me thinking, okay, here it goes. We're going to talk about this lecture about free will and, and uh, responsibility and divine sovereignty. I don't want to do that. Nor do I want to open up the idea of the debate between Arminians and Calvinists this morning. Not interested in that. Nor do I want to talk about to what extent does God um, interact with human will. I don't. Are they worth having those conversations? Sure. But here's what I'm afraid of. We want to have these conversations, and we miss the beauty of the sovereignty of our God. And we want to know it in our head, and we don't want to worship and bow before him. Listen, this truth that God is capable of managing your life, no matter where you find yourself, no matter what's happening on, is a truth that should humble us to our knees. We should see him high and lifted up as the ruler of all creation, knowing that this God is capable of caring for me no matter where he finds me. And instead of trying to get in a box and write it down and win a debate, we should come adoring and worshiping and praising the God of heaven because this God is capable of taking care of you no matter where he finds you. And can we not praise him for his sovereignty this morning? Can we not just say, God, I don't know, but I praise you. You are God, and you are worthy, and you're bigger than all of this, and I can trust you, God, because you are in control. You're not, and I'm not. And listen, I'm not minimizing man's responsibility. You know this. You sin. You make choices. You pay for those choices. And some of those consequences last for a lifetime. I'm not minimizing any of that. What I'm saying is this, that our God is bigger. He is capable. He rules the heavens and the earth. And you can trust him this morning. This world does seem like it's out of control. But it's not. Our God rules. And our God reigns. So, You can trust him because he's capable. But now here's the second question. 
What about his character? I mean, does he rule and reign like a despot? Does he, does he just, like, I'm going to be a control freak and whatever I say goes, I don't care what anybody says or thinks. How does he, how does he interact with us? Now listen, when we talk about God's sovereignty, his sovereignty is his prerogative. That's how he operates. But it's not by himself. It operates because of his character. That the God of heaven is all-knowing, all-wise, all-powerful, and all-good. And this God who rules and reigns is not only the sovereign Lord, but he is a loving Savior. And he does care where you're at. And it's the idea of his love that we can rest assured that not only do we have peace, we have comfort. Take your Bibles this morning and look at probably one of the greatest passages, one of the richest passages, Romans chapter 8, in dealing with the sovereignty of God and his love toward his people. Romans chapter 8. And look with me, if you would, down at verse number 28. Can I trust God? Yes, you can. Why? Because he's capable. He rules. He rules and reigns. He is the God of heaven. He is sovereign. But you can also trust him because of his character. As ruler, he loves his children. Romans chapter 8, verse 28, you know the verse, often misquoted and used for other things. For we know that all things work together for good. It doesn't stop there. This verse is not for every Sally and Joe. This is for God's people. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestine to be conformed to the image of of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own Son, but delivered him up, For us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercessions for me. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long, and we are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And listen, what he's saying is this. Our God is sovereign, and for his people, he is working all things out for their good. Whether they see it or not, it will be for their good, for his glory. But in the midst of all of this, he wants you to know that as a sovereign God, he is a loving Savior that loves his people, and he does care where you're at. And there are times in our life when we think, God, Okay, I can buy that you're in control. But what about when there's evil in my own heart? Do you still love me? Are you still working these things for good? I tell you something, I'm talking to Christians this morning. Your heart and my heart can be full of evil. I'm not talking about the neighbor down the road or the guy at work. I'm talking about the Christian heart can be full of evil. Do you know something? You, You might find this hard to believe. But there are times I say something and it comes out of my mouth. And when it did, I can't grab it fast enough. And I thought, oh my goodness, where did that come from? It just came from up here? No, it came from in here. <laughs> and there are times I think, and I have these thoughts, and I think, oh my word, I can't believe I just had that thought. I know you want to know what the thought is. I'm not going to tell you what it is. I could just kill him. And that, that, that's in there. And sometimes you think, Lord, I know myself. How is it that you could even love me? And he answers it in Romans. He says, who's going to lay anything to your charge? It's God who 
justifies. It's Christ who died. And the truth of the matter is this. We do have evil in our heart. God is in control, and his character is love. Even when there's evil within, he has given a way for me to be cleansed and redeemed. If I confess my sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He loves me that much that when I blow it, I find refreshing, cleansing, and restoration in our God. It's a beautiful truth. I think it was Newton who said, Well may the accuser roar of sins that I have done. I know them all and thousands more. Jehovah knoweth none. And what God is saying is, I am working things together for good, and I love you. Even when there's evil in your heart, I have provided a way through Christ for that to be taken care of. No one can condemn you now. It's a beautiful truth. But then he says, okay, God, if there's evil in my heart, you love me. But what about all this evil that's happening around me? I mean, if you're looking at my life right now, God, it's not good. It's not a nice place to be. I would rather not be here right now. Certainly, with all the bad that's happening now, how in the world could you love me? And he answers that question. He tells us that, that none of these things shall separate us from his love. Tribulation, distress, persecution, or, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. And there are times when we look around in our life, it's like, God, I, how, do, how can you love me? Look at all these bad things that are happening. And from our perspective, they are bad. He says, wait a minute, I want you to know something. No matter what's swirling around you, my love is faithful and consistent. I love you in the midst of all of that, of all of that. He says, we are more than conquerors for him that loved us. And so this morning, I want you to know, as we look at this God of heaven, we can trust him. He is in control. He is capable. And we can trust him because not only is he in control, but his character is one that he loves his children. He knows exactly what, you, what you're going through and exactly what you need. And in all this, we see the resourcefulness of our God and the ingenuity of his wisdom. He says, I'm working all together for good, even when I can't figure it out. And this is how good our God is. That whether we sin or someone sins against us and these things are swirling in around in our world, that he says, I can still work this for good because I have a purpose for you. I have a purpose for my people. My purpose is to mold and shape them into the image of Christ. And it's, it's ingenious how he does it. He does it often through trials and trouble. Some of you are saying right now, hey, listen, I'd like to skip that part. I mean, I'm thankful he's in control, and I'm thankful he loves me, but if I could just skip the trials and tribulations and all that, I would be okay with that. The truth is, you would not be okay with that, because the bottom line is, we need these things in our life to conform us to the image of Christ. We do. We are hard heads. Listen to what Tozer said. He said, it is highly doubtful that God can use anyone greatly until he has crushed him deeply. How are you going to relate to anyone if you've never suffered loss? We had friends that that we grew up with, and they seemed to have the charm life, almost as if nothing bad ever happened in their life. And I'm serious. I mean, for years, they they had children, raised their kids, and it was just like nothing. They couldn't even relate. If you said, what's the worst thing that happened to you? They couldn't think of anything bad. I got a ticket one time. That's it? And, and there was no relating to people until they went through real struggles in their home. And all of a sudden, guess what? There's some of the sweetest godly people you will know that give you advice that would help you in any situation. Why? Because they suffered through that time. How are you going to weep with someone if you've never wept yourself? You pat them on the head with a broom, sort of, yeah, take care of you, stay at a distance there. How are you going to comfort anyone if you've not been comforted by the comfort that God has given you? And so this God is so big that he is in control, that his character is loving, and then he takes all of these things in our life and he uses them for good. And I know there are times we don't see it. I know there are times we don't understand. He says, I love you, and I'm molding and shaping you into the image of the Son. And we must learn to respond faithfully to the ordering of our life from the hand of a loving father. Can I tell you something this week? 
you can trust God. And no matter where you find yourself, you can trust him. He is capable. He is sovereign. But not only is he capable, I can trust him because he loves me. If you ever doubt his love, you better go back to Romans 8 because he says, he that gave his son for you, shall he not freely give you all things? And so as we face this week, we must remember that wherever we find ourselves, and our world seems to be swirling out of control, and we look around at the sins of others and sin that impacts our life and sin of creation and all the things that we struggle with, my friend, you can trust him this morning. You can trust him. Whether it's through the drive through you can trust him. He's working something in your life. Whether it's at work with that guy or that girl who's just a dingbat that they get under your skin, it's like, God, why are they even on this planet? I know you're seeing faces right now, right? So what's that about? It's about God teaching you something about you that you haven't learned yet about yourself. He's working all of this out for your good and for his glory when we face discouragement. We don't know where to turn. He, he's working this to draw us closer to him. Hey, let's be honest. When's the last time everything was good, money in the bank, everyone's healthy, and you thought, you know what, I'm just going to pray for a couple hours because God's so good. But when the bottom falls out, we run to him. He is working all these things out for our good. If you're going through deep waters this morning, I want you to know something. The arm of flesh will fail you. It does. It always will. But you can trust the sovereign God. You can trust him because he's capable. He knows the end from the beginning. And not your choice or my choice or anyone's choice or action will ever foil what he is doing. Never. Yes, responsible. Yes, consequences. How does it work? I don't know. I'm going to praise him for his sovereignty. He's in control. And I can trust him because I know that this God loves me. He loves me so much that he sent his son to die in my place. You going to give up your kid for somebody? I'm not. I'm just, I, I couldn't imagine. For you, for you, for you. God gave his son for you. And so we can trust him. And as our life is unfolding before us this week, may we faithfully respond to his ordering, knowing that everything comes from the hand of loving Father. Let's pray this morning.